Hello, sir. Step right in. The store is open. A young girl with chubby red cheeks waves at you, smiling. Her nose is red from the cold. Hello. Are you interested in a new and exciting book? She stomps her feet to feel warmer. What kind of store is this anyway? It's a bookstore, sir. We sell books, postcards, and some board games. It's called Crime, Romance, and Biographies of Famous People. She points at the window. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold your horses, little girl. What is a book? That is a book. They have stories inside them. It's like someone told you a story in a really long letter. She points at the stands. What's a postcard? A postcard is a small cardboard picture. You can write a few words on the other side and send it to your friend or beloved. She observes you for a moment. She is unfazed by your questions. She would consider it impolite to point out any perceived weirdness. What is a board game? Board games are like little games on a table, made to pass the time. There are several different ones, but sailors here mostly buy cards. She pauses to ponder. Interesting, thanks. My pleasure. Anything else you'd like to know? Can I ask you some questions? Okay, sir. I'll try to answer any questions you have. I hope they're about books. What's your name? My name is Annette, sir. My mum, her name is Plaisance. She owns the store. She's inside, minding the register, or organising the stock. The girl gazes at the window and suddenly jolts her eyes wide as if recalling something. Feel free to step in and browse our wares. <laughs> Why are you standing out here in the cold? I'm signalling that the store is open. Otherwise, people might not know. They'd miss out on the crime, romance, and biographies of famous people. She nods eagerly. A sudden gush of wind turns the pages of the books on the counters. She covers her face, smiling. But she's cold. You're cold. Can I help in some way? Kind of you to offer, sir. She doesn't know what else to say. What could you do to help her anyway? I could have a word with the store owner, maybe? Oh, no, no, sir. I'm happy to help Mum by luring in customers. Besides, I have some hot juice in my vacuum bottle to keep warm. She stands upright and smiles like a little soldier. Shouldn't you be at school or something? I do my studies at home at the moment. I have to help Mum keep this place running. Isn't school more important than this? Mum says it's necessary to do both because it builds character. <sighs> Mum says a proper worker is dutiful. That's how you get ahead in life. You succeed. How's the business going? Mum says it's peachy. She was a little afraid at first. There's talk about this house being cursed. She looks over her shoulder. Behind her, the window has been boarded up. You sense the boards creaking, twisting for a second, and some kind of doubt in her tense shoulders. Cursed in what way? Cursed in the way that makes them say that no business has ever really thrived here, sir. That they all go... She's looking for the right word. Ass up, say nothing. Well, they run out of money and have to stop doing business. I don't. Uh, sounds rather serious. I should probably look into this. Narrow your eyes and look through the creaking boards on the window. We can go into the bookstore and ask about the case. But I don't see much more to look into here. The lieutenant makes a note in his notebook. Yes. Please do look at our wares inside. The postcards and board games you asked about are also there, sir. She chirps. What do you know about the other failed businesses? Nothing really, sir. Mum doesn't allow me to sneak around in the back rooms or the cellar. I don't really know what's there. She looks a bit disappointed. How does this curse manifest itself? It does not manifest itself in any way. It does not exist. I liked it better when we were talking about whether it's appropriate to stand out in the freezing weather. But Kim, the plasmic manifestations. No such thing. Lieutenant stands at your side, stern and serious. Uh, anything else you wanted to talk about, sir? The girl looks back and forth between you two. Hmm, stroke your chin. Enough about the curse for now. Maybe I can tell you about some of our books instead. Annette looks at your shaved, prickly chin. It distinctly contracts with the oily mutton chops that surround it. What is this crime business? Crime fiction is about murders or burglaries or things like that. And the work of a policeman or a private detective who's trying to solve a crime and catch the criminals. Not crime fiction. I need to know what crime is. Uh... She doesn't know what to say. It's that bad. Point to your head. Crime is what we were solving before this conversation began. Why would anyone want to read about crime? It's exciting to people, I guess. They get to imagine dangerous things. And it's kind of like a puzzle where you can guess who the criminal is or how the good guys are going to catch him. I'm a policeman myself, by the way. You don't look much like a policeman. 
<laughs> she examines you as if to find something policeman-like. What does a cop look like, then? Didn't mean to offend, sir. Sorry, sir. It's just that you don't look like Dick Mullen. She points to a book cover on which you see a strapping, a strapping vespertine officer. He stands grimly over the body of a dead woman. I used to be exactly like that Mullen guy. Then I decided to live a little... Nobody actually looks like that guy in the picture. It's a stupid fantasy of a man. It's not your body that's important to police work anywhere. It's your point to your head. Head? Yes. No. It's your soul. Mm. Your blue soul. Not head, child. Heads. Soul. That Mullen guy looks like a Hempelman who could respect that face. It's not even drawn correctly. He lacks soul. Flexibility. There are millions of different people out there and you have to get into their heads. Sometimes you gotta be the killer to catch the killer. Ah, oh, first one. Um, I'm not sure I understand. She examines the illustration of Dick Mullen attempting to find his soul. A policeman's gotta have the right stuff, an ingrained sense of the law. No one would follow a weakling like Mullen. If you say so, sir. He's just a fictional character. He's no match for your soul. She smiles mischievously. Maybe you can show me some real police work, sir. Like in the books. Oh, I'm going to do something now. Okay. What is romance? It's the type of book where there's a rich lady and she has to choose between the good man and the bad man. She smiles at the thought, perhaps imagining herself in the situation. Or there could be a story about a poor lady getting a rich man. It's about man and lady business, sir. What about a poor man getting a rich lady? It happens, but usually the guy gets rich in the process. Or should actually be rich himself, but has lost his family property unjustly. Like during the revolution or something. I see. Those are unhappy books for most of the pages. People sad about what they have lost, but then it all turns out just fine in the end. What about when both of the men are bad? These are not very common. You can't have a choice between bad and bad. Nobody wants to read a story like that. What if it's written really well? Well, maybe then it's fine. Maybe if the lady then decides not to pick either because she doesn't need a bad man. Yes, that would be interesting. What about when everyone is poor? That's really not a proper romance story. That's more like everyday life. Sometimes you have to write about real life things. Not in romance books, sir. These are about nice and pretty people, and everyone is happy in the end. What about a book where the man and lady business doesn't work out at all? I haven't read many of those. Maybe you should ask Mum. You think she has one about an excruciatingly painful breakup? I don't think it's a romance story if the main characters break up, though. She pauses, trying to figure out the appropriate answer. No, 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 think about it. One where they plunge into a torrid spiral of pain and recrimination, only it's really long and drawn out. Scarred for life. Phantom limb. Um, no, I don't know. She looks at you with puzzlement. Doesn't ring a bell. I'll ask your mom. Isn't it atonement? I'm thinking atonement. <laughs> Is It's not about a breakup, but it's... And I don't know that it's a romance story. I think there's romance in it. But that is like, that is a book that's just all about pain. It's just really long, drawn out, scarred for life. <laughs> all right, I'll ask your mom. Yes, she knows books, definitely. She nods, relieved. What was that? An idea for an unfinished novel stuck somewhere in your forebrain? No, that was just my life experiences. Later, when you get the chance, you should address these issues by getting drunk. That'll show them. Oh, I don't think it will. That's enough romance for me. Maybe some about other books? Who are these famous people? Oh, kings and queens and generals of old, or artists and writers, or musicians, those kinds of people. There's usually something extraordinary about them. She scratches her cold reddened cheek, then continues. I think that's why people read them, to find the secrets of their fame. Seems like most people who read those books fail to get more famous from reading them. Reading those don't make the readers more famous, does it? But it does make the famous people more famous. She smiles gleefully. Fame sounds delicious. Maybe someone will write a book about me one day. Famous for vain people have better things to do. These famous people sound like a bunch of dorks. I guess? Me? Why would they do that, sir? Because I'm a superstar cop. In the papers and everything, that'll show- I'll be a superstar cop in the papers and everything, that'll show them. That's so cool. Maybe they'll make you a book cover picture and everything. Standing over a dead body, holding a gun. Who's that? Point to the woman browsing books. Oh, that's Auntie Billy. She's nice if a bit distressed. She's your aunt? <laughs> no, no, sir. She's a working woman who comes to look at the books a lot. Why is she distressed? 
I think she is a bad husband. Aww. Not very nice or helpful. Oh. Oh. Okay. What's this? As you turn, a bright light catches your eye, making you squint. Where's it coming from? From a distant sunset, a stage light, flash photography, nowhere in particular. It's just what superstar law officers do. They squint at lights and they solve shit. Yeah, that's me. I've been establishing my superstardom hard lately. Yeah, you have. You're a big dick cop. Dick Mullen. Salam Rocky Bayi. Badass on the edge disco cop. Time to recede into a ludicrous fantasy world. Here we go. Camera. Lights. Action. With a sudden flash, the world freezes around you. And you along with it. In an iconic monochrome solution, a black silhouette against a rasterized orange world. It's on. Yay! I did have a red bubble, a red thought bubble, when I walked by here. There it is. It's just like... The book appears to be erotica, but without actual erotica? What? Um, your husband. My husband? No, he's not. This little girl told me you have a bad husband. Excuse me? A bad husband? What do you mean? Not nice or helpful? Do policemen just go around repeating what some kid off the street said? She doesn't mean to be antagonistic, but she can't help coming off defensive. Those were her words, not mine. I'm merely asking. Can I give you some friendly advice, Mr. Policeman? Don't listen to kids. So you don't have a bad husband? No, I don't. I have a good husband. The kind and helpful sort. And he's not missing. He's totally missing. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. The woman before you nods and returns to her reading. Do I have anything? Oops. With composure. Okay, nothing else that helps with composure. Hello again, sir. Let's try this. You fail no. to deduce anything substantial. She waits intently. I'm a detective. I deduce you are a girl. I deduce you are very small. Sorry, I can't deduce anything. It's okay, sir. A small disappointment rolls over her, but she promptly gets over it. <laughs> you disappointed a small child. Well done, champ. Okay, bye. See you around. No, we're gonna we're gonna fix this. Hello again, sir. Let's try it again. The girl keeps her hands folded, hidden. Why is that? Why do you keep your hands folded? What do you mean, sir? She looks wary. She knows where this is going. You don't need to be worried. I'm here to help. She looks around anxiously. Her hands remain folded in front of her. She doesn't want to show them. The lieutenant stands by, looking at the two of you with little interest. A facade of true professionalism. He is far more intrigued by the situation than his poise reveals. It's okay. She brings out her reddened hands, her nails frayed. Nearly chewed down to the flesh. You bite your nails. And you knew this from me keeping my hands folded? She shoots you a suspicious glance. There were a few other hints. Well, that proves nothing. Anyone could do an easy deduction like that. Apparently not. Her eyes flash with defiance. She's not impressed. She actually is impressed. This is more like a defensive reflex. I can figure out why I can, I bite, why you bite your nails. I got a few reasons in mind. She nods, half provocative, half enthusiastic. You're uptight because of your mother and the pressure she's putting on you. Rats have been nibbling your fingers. Chewed on nails means you're recycling your body material. It's a intense. It's an intense dedication to the way of business. There are no riches without personal sacrifice. Yeah, the first one. Maybe so, sir. Okay, I know it's a bad habit, and I shouldn't. D dismay flickers in her eyes, and she sighs. I hope this entertained you. Uh, 
I'm wondering if saying that I'm an ace detective puts another point in Superstar Cop. But I don't want to make it about me when it's about her. It was okay, sir. She's still got a rebellious streak. There's more that can be achieved here. Ask her to do the same. Can you do something about me? You're quite sober. She snaps back quickly. The lieutenant does not flinch at the comment. He does not flinch even a single bit. He is intensely <laughs> not flinching. It takes effort. How do you know I'm usually not? Because you usually aren't. I'm also sad and my head hurts. I'm sorry, sir. I hope things get better soon. She looks you in the eye, a gleam of sympathy on her face. There she stands, swaying on her feet, assaulted by the early spring breeze. She smiles at you. The whole situation suddenly feels familiar. Somehow, there's something you're missing. What are you missing? I'm going to save. Just in case my 72% isn't enough. Hi, Ace Detective. Are you here for more books? Because you know each other. She's been talking to you so openly because you've talked before. Hang on, you know me. We've met before. Yes, I stand in this spot all the time. She sways back and forth on her feet. You've been running around all week without your shirt on, sir. <laughs> Apologizing to everyone. I don't really understand what you've done wrong. Did I ever talk to you? Of course. You've stopped by a few times. You certainly look better than the last time I saw you. She looks at you intently. Thanks, I'm trying. Yeah, I can see. You don't have party eyes anymore. Party eyes. Yes, of course. That makes sense. The lieutenant, slowly, ever so slowly, realizes something. I'm not surprised children have seen you running around with party eyes on, he thinks. Not at all. Party eyes? You know, like a cat in the dark, all big and wide-eyed. <laughs> it certainly looks odd on a man. The swiveling eyes of a loony drug addict. That is what she meant. You were probably gurning to. Fuck yeah. You should get some party eyes right now. Snap those sequins on you, boy. You need to shush. I have been partaking in narcotics. Oh, baby. That's not what you have to worry about. Worry about the important thing. Why didn't you tell me you knew me to begin with? I didn't know I had to do that. She looks puzzled. Thanks, I've learned something about myself today. I'm glad I could help you, sir. She smiles a wide, helpful smile. Aww. I was thinking about going back to the pawn shop and trying whatever that pill was. And now that I talked to this girl, I'm thinking, no, maybe I won't. <laughs> Party eye. Oh. I wonder if she would have said something different if I had taken that. Well, we finally made it. Hold on. Nope. Nope. There we go. That's the door. What's this? <laughs> Gift, books, and molten candy. The display rack is brimming with worn paperbacks featuring an extremely muscular, sword-wielding barbarian on the cover. Nearly all the titles contain the word Hyundar somewhere. Storkeep, tell me about the Muscle Man books. Oh, Man from Hyundar. A very popular series of adventure novels. They're awfully immoral and violent books. She looks at the books with some disdain. Why are they so popular? Blood and violence, scantily clad women, Epic narratives, all those mystical things he encounters, they're bound to grab those with little imagination and nothing to do. <laughs> Sounds good, which one should I start with? What does it matter? They're all the same. However, the customer is always right, they say. She rolls her eyes and fiddles with her pendant. If you're a novice of the series, I'd recommend Hjelm Dalaman, the man from Hjelmdal. It's supposed to be a good introduction to the series. I I don't know if I should buy books. Um, look through the display. Rows and rows of Hiem Dalamen blur your vision. You make out some titles. Man from Hiem Dal and the Mammoth Riders. Man from Hiem Dal. Return to Hiem Dal. 
and the solipsistic man from Hyomdal and the Hyomdal man. Good God, how many are there? Maybe a hundred. Man from Hyomdal and the sages at the end of the world. Man from Hyomdal and the false god. Man from Hyomdal and the scorched earth. Man from Hyomdal, the Hyomdal colonies. Man from Hyomdal and the swamp beast. Man from Hyomdal and the snow crabs. I have a feeling that's not all. Not even close. Oh my god. Man from Hyomdal in hell. Man from Hyomdal and the forest of slaves. Man from Hyomdal under the lake. Man from Hyomdal, Hyomdal burning. There's even the trial of death. A pastoral combat game book set in the world of Yondalaman, and so much more. Do any of these call out to me? It's a white check. Nothing of interest. Only silence and the cosmic background pain radiation. Okay. Now let's hit tab instead of the caps lock. Old sports magazines tucked away in a dark corner. Book collects national recipes of Arda. They're all about lake trout. A small mountain of colorful board game boxes. Oh. There are numerous types of games for all ages. A lot of shelf space seems to be taken up by Wirral related merchandise. What board games do you have here? Wonderful board games, sir. The Viticulturist is a classic for sure. Or perhaps you'd like Archipelagos of Insulinda, a very educational game for those interested in geography. Browbritta is a fun game of economic competition, but can get quite intense after a while. We have games for the whole family. You can play with your children. Who are you going to play board games with? Do you have friends or family? Do I have friends? Look at the lieutenant. Are you actually friends or just colleagues thrown together by circumstance? I don't feel as if I have any kids. Friends are technically like family. She fiddles with her pendant, thinking. For playing with friends, I'd recommend Suzerainity. It's a civilization building game where you build a civilization, then set off to brutally colonize and repress other civilizations. Oh, gosh. 12 <laughs> I don't know that I want to buy that. What about all these we're all things? Lousy auras there. No, role-playing games are popular among those types. You know, who are into those kind of things. Personally, I don't like it. Not at all. You best like role-playing games. You're in one. I've heard they turn people into occult enthusiasts. <laughs> that they have rituals where they try to summon entities. Highly immoral stuff. You can still buy them, though. She looks at the table crossing her arms. Looks through the pile of where all related items. An endless variety of source books, law books, and codices litter the table. The topmost book is titled Welkin Compendium, second edition. There's also a large hardbound tome with intricate cover art, The Hunters of Catawack, Boreal Creature Compendium, and a Pick Your Path adventure game book titled Tales of Wirral, Cavern of Velcrag, Books in a board game section? Who wants to read books? Anything catch my eye? There's a box that says, We're out. Third edition mega setting supplements module. The side panel notes, A fantastic adventure board game. New maps and miniatures. A sticker on it displays 25 real. That price is steep. But then it's the third edition mega setting supplement. So it makes sense. Nonsense for anemic beano clouds. <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna buy stuff. I need my money for for the hotel. Should I go upstairs? Cause we're technically gonna go down and what happens if I click on this? You see a set of tattered curtains blocking the way to another room. A strange cage like trinket dangles from the curtains. Excuse me, officer. The back room is strictly for employees only. What's behind the curtains? Nothing. Now please go back to browsing the books. Don't you feel compelled to look at the books? 
The books are all you care about. She fiddles with her pendant. She speaks almost as if she's trying to put a spell on you, urging you to buy more books. Oddly enough, the more she tries to draw you away from the curtains, the more alluring they become. Examine the strange cage-like trinket. You see some kind of charm, an irregular polyhedron assembled from bones, sticks, and straw. Inside, a disturbing fish head with empty eye sockets stares at you. This is a traditional Seminese ward, meant to provide protection against ill luck, bad dreams, curses, and other supernatural scourges. I think we've covered who the Seminese are, but that's the only question we have to ask. Inhabitants of Ile de Fantom, the Seminine Islands down south. Aside from poking at it suspiciously, there is nothing else to do with the fish head charm at this time. The curtains remain shut before you. Pull open the curtains? Just as you're about to pull apart the curtains, the petrified voice of the shop owner cries out once more. Sir, don't touch that. I told you it's off limits for the customers. Her hand is closed around her pendant, her fingers nervously playing with the talisman. Parapsychologically speaking, we're dumb if you decide to open them. I won't be held responsible for the consequences. It's too dangerous. She looks away, mumbling. Why is everyone always messing with the curtains? Why can't they just buy books like normal people? I've heard there's a fridge there that I need. Is this about the curse? That's why you're afraid? No, it's just a storeroom for the employees, I told you. Now please step away from the curtain. She's almost begging you. But I sense this place calling for me. I must investigate beyond the threshold. You do? My god, even more reasons not to mess with the curtains. Just step away, dear sir. She grabs her pendant again, visibly shaken. Ma'am, this is different. I'm a police officer. I need to get in there. Why? It's not like anyone was killed there. She stops abruptly as her hand flies over her mouth, baffled by her own bluntness. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be so impolite. Just please don't go there. I can't allow that. You'll only make things worse and unleash the powers. There's a fridge there that I need. Everybody suddenly needs something from there. Leave the curtains be. It's what it wants. I'll think about it. Thank you. Let's just talk about this first, all right? There's no reason for you to venture into the unknown. Hmm. What are you, a coward? Think about the marvelous adventures waiting for us on the other side. Shut up, necktie. Talking is always good. Go see what she has to say. I will. There is something mysterious about the curtains. Be careful. The curtains, tattered with age and covered in dust, hang before you, as if taunting you. Ignore. These shelves are overburdened with books from the same series. You see the name Dick Mullen over and over. What's all this crime fiction? Oh, crime, robberies, murders, even sexual crimes. We're fortunate to have Dick Mullen and his stories to sort all that out. She lowers her voice. You're a, a police officer, apparently. You should buy all of these. They really do teach a person how to be a proper detective. <laughs> Look through the display of books. Crime fiction is a disgrace. An asinine misrepresentation of the physical attributes of the arduous everyday work of actual police officers. These books greatly overstate the excitement of police work, glossing over how long it takes to actually follow up on leads and eliminate dead ends. What's more, they completely ignore the psychological hardships of year after year coming into contact with people during the worst days of their lives. Not a single mention of all the stress this work creates upon the officer's family. Detective fiction just doesn't tell the truth at all. Now, would you like a list of all the books found on the shelf? <sighs> I mean, we, we got a list of the others, so sure. You see, Dick Mullen on the job. Get me Mullen. The stalwart adventures of Richard P. Mullen. Dick Mullen and the murder in the orchard. The sordid affair of Dick Mullen. A killing is declared. Dick Mullen in the murder house. 
the final case of Dick Mullen. An <laughs> obvious lie. Dick Mullen in the clock tower. The ordeals of Dick Mullen. Dauntless Dick. Dick Mullen's funeral pyre. The murder of Dick Mullen. Uh, does he die? Oh, no. Turns out he faked it to solve a case. Of course. What else is there? Yes. There's also the dame who did it. Farewell, my Mullen. Faking death seems to be a common trope in the Mullen series. The morbid tales of Dick Mullen. A dark tide turns. Tragedy calls for Dick Mullen. Another one with fake death. And, of course, Dick Mullen, the murderer. In order to catch a murderer, Dick Mullen must become the murderer. Mm -hmm. Come on, this is not the way real police solve crimes. The real police are some 20 kilometers away, sitting in an armored motor carriage. Come on, Chester, tell the story again. A bald man turns toward a lean man and pats him on the back. Again? Man, I tell that one at least once a month. It's not that interesting. The fuck it is. And these guys haven't heard it. You see, Chester here. He pokes his finger at the lean man. Chester faked his own death once. Gosh, why? One civilian looks on amazed. The bald man bellows a reply. A very fucking dangerous case. Ain't that right, Chester? They almost got you that time. Yeah, sure came close. All right, so I was tailing this guy called Francis the Shoe. The inside of the motor carriage is thick with cigarette smoke. Outside, it starts to rain. After all this, you still haven't found the answer to the one question that matters. Who is Dick Mullen? Good question. I wonder if I can ask her who the heck Dick Mullen is. Welcome to Crime, Romance, and Biographies of Famous People. My name is Plaisance. The clerk extends a greeting. Be welcome, and please take responsibility for the energy you bring into this space. A golden pendant hangs around the woman's neck in the shape of what looks like a tiny fish head trapped in amber. You seem well enough. Can you give me some money? Curious pendant you're wearing. Narrow your eyes mysteriously. Sure. Oh, yes. Helps to have an anchor in these times. She clutches the pendant and narrows her eyes as well. I guess this is the only appropriate moment to ask her. If we can have some money. Sir, don't be ridiculous. I certainly will not give you money. I would be doing you a grave psychic disfavor. She gives you a disapproving look. One has to earn one's success, even if one is a police officer. Handouts are nothing but manipulation. All they do is make you dependent. Certainly there are good things to be said about dependence. It would forge ties between us working people, good practice for fighting our common enemy. I'm a powerful feudal lord, I demand tribute. This is about traditions. <laughs> What kind of business relationship with that kickstart? I don't even know why I said that. Mm, let's try this first one. Now, hey there. Sounds like someone isn't taking responsibility for the energy they bring into this space. She raises her finger. Fighting enemy. My philosophy is everyone just getting along. And you're the owner? I am. The proudest owner of our little shop of culture. Her voice is high-pitched as if to give it more penetration. She has fine-tuned her voice to find the most welcoming approach for attracting new customers. It doesn't work. Why are you so uptight about those curtains? I was told there was a huge fridge in the building center. I was looking for a book about cockatoos. What if I want to buy a book? Girl outside mentioned this place is cursed. Your daughter is the one standing outside. All right. Whoa, a book about cockatoos. A book about cockatoos? There should be one upstairs. Right next to the shelf of biographies. Okay, and what if I want to buy a book? Goodness, you were already doing good browsing the shelves. Why'd you stop? Don't you feel compelled? Go, go, get back there. The books await you. She fiddles her pendant, then waves her bony fingers directly at you. What type of books do you have? Everything is on the shelves. Take a look yourself. The shelves compel you, don't they? She nudges her glasses. She smiles and nods. 
seemingly relieved. I told her I'd take another look. Why? Are you, why? Uh, the girl outside mentioned this place is cursed. Cursed? Who said that? Annette? I will have a word with her. This place is not cursed. It has a robustly magnetic energy. Good for commercial activity. My business is thriving, sir. What in God's name is she talking about? <laughs> it doesn't feel like it's thriving. Feels ghostly. That's your daughter outside, right? Annette, yes, my daughter. I hope she wasn't slacking off again with her nose in science fiction. Tell me, was she at her post doing her job like a proper girl? I wish I could say she was very proficient, but all I can say is she wasn't slacking off. Oh no, this is... Yes, she was doing her job like a good girl. Wonderful. Did you talk to her? Yes. Great. On a scale of 1 to 10, how compelled were you to buy books after talking with her? Her opinion of her daughter depends on how well she lured you into the store. 10. She is certainly very polite and helpful. My precious, her dedication brings joy to my heart. If you have children, I hope they turn out as great as my Annette. She's immensely satisfied with the answer. The way you're handling her strikes me as wrong. I'm here to dismantle the free market and abolish child labor. Uh, I do have some concerns. Mind your own business, sir. In our society, people don't get to tell each other how to raise their children. It's none of your or anyone's business. Her posture becomes very rigid. Denial is the way she copes with criticism. I'm here to dismantle the free market and abolish child labor. You must be kidding. There's nothing like that happening. How much do you pay your daughter? Good, sir. What does a young child do with money anyway? No, I save it for her as a fund. She's securing her financial future out there. Slap the cuffs on her. Such criminal behavior would not happen in more developed countries. I formally recommend you reprimand you for your corrupt activities. In some more developed countries, this sort of thing is two felonies, child labor and slavery. Those countries will realize they've raised a lazy and spoiled generation. The frick. Are we done with the jokes now? Her tone is decisive, not at all angry at the insinuation. Yes, we've had quite enough fun here. Right. The lieutenant taps his foot. All this pressure has made her really anxious. You know she's been chewing her nails? God, I've told her not to do that. It's disgusting. And I told you to mind your own business. Clearly, you have no idea how hard it is to raise a girl in this economy. Her voice is firm. This economy is a mysterious force, like cosmic weather. Mysterious and harsh. I don't think she can do anything about it. She can, if she has enough willpower. This is what's called growing pains. Life isn't easy. Life doesn't give breaks. Willpower is not how you get past anxiety. Come on, ma'am. It's obvious she can't do anything about it. You are placing an unnecessary burden on a young child. What you're doing is wrong. Even I know that, and I usually don't know anything. <laughs> she stands stiff and severe, silently fuming. Ten or so seconds pass without change. She's looking for one, but there simply aren't any good arguments for being an asshole. Well, that... <laughs> doesn't normally stop people. Oh no. Hold on. I need to invite her inside and apologize. She must be freezing out there. All of a sudden she exhales sharply. Her shoulders slump down. There. I don't know what to say to you. My husband, he tries to teach me business lessons. I have what my mother called a dull mind. All this stress. She stops, but her mouth keeps moving. It sounds like both the husband and the mother treat her the way she treats Annette. You're like Annette to your husband and your mother. Oh, well, my mother was horrible, of course. Absolutely perverse energies around that person. But my husband... She shakes her head. My husband is completely different, of course. Is this husband Annette's father? Yes, my husband is a successful entrepreneur east of the river. If only he were more involved in the business we're running up here. No matter. Soon we'll both be off for Grand Caron. What's Grand Caron? It's a proper place to live. One of the most peaceful neighborhoods east of Jamrock. You may know it for its massive housing projects. Most of the buildings are empty at the moment. It's a great opportunity to get ahead of the crowds. 
better times ahead for sure. Her smile is wide. Your husband's also involved with the bookstore? He made the initial investment. Since then, he's been what you might call a silent partner. Hmm. Super silent. Almost inaudibly so. Yeah, is she an only child? Yes, I'm afraid so. A real treat she is. It would be nice if she had... No, we couldn't have afforded more children, really. Not in this economy. Why not? We're quite busy people, you know, my husband and I. Quite busy. Children are a lot of work. You don't look like a father, so I don't expect you to understand. I get it. I'm sorry. I'm sure you do understand. No, it's fine. It's totally fine. <laughs> she told me she doesn't go to school anymore? She's been too busy helping me here. So she studied at home this trimester. This is a temporary solution, of course. I assure you, I of all people understand the importance of education. She will be back in school the moment the store takes off. And what if it doesn't, though? And hell freezes over? Never mind. It's not a good topic to get into. Okay. The woman looks aloof. Her features much softer. Occasionally, she glances at her daughter's silhouette. I mean, at least, you know, I don't have any... Homeschooling can be fine. I don't know. Anyway, uh, I will come back and ask you about these things. You're inside. I'm sorry, sir. I can't talk right now. I'm very busy with my homework. I have so much homework now. You just can't win. <laughs> Out of the rain and into the gutter. What are you doing now? Math. It's really difficult. Like, really. They say you need it to get rich. Better than standing outside in the cold, I guess. She looks to her notebook with trepidation. Oh, oh, I found something while you were away. What is it? I thought this would fit you. Like, thanks for helping out. Dad? Not me. The city, I mean. Like a detective does. She gives you a hat almost exactly like the one Dick Mullen wears on the covers. Where'd you get it? Just what Dick Mullen would ask. I got it from behind the curtains. I'm not really supposed to go there. It's a fedora? Maybe. It's the hat Dick Mullen wears all the time. You'll look way more serious with that. She grins with joy. Right, I have to get back to my homework now, before Mum notices. Man, this is hard. She looks back at the infernal scribblings under her nose. Okay, let's put this hat on. Plus one to encyclopedia. Let's quick save. Go back up here. Maybe having his hat on will help us? Maybe? Shelves filled to the brim with chronicles hmm. featuring the supp- Alright, maybe I'll come back to it. It's a tome of fascist magic? Okay. Quaint. Picture book brochure, very colorful. The plaque on the shelf reads, Biographies of Famous People. You see a large variety of names, none of which ring a bell. Anything of note on the shelf? I would say... The Greatest Innocence. Yes, most certainly. It's an important educational tool delving into the depths of history, religion, and their relation to innocentic power. Who or what is an innocence? A very influential historical mm. figure. But surely I don't have to tell you that. You're a law officer, and law officers have at least some education. She waves her hand as if casting aside the thought. The book is also very daring. The author aims to re-examine the universal understandings of the innocentic system, creating a fresh vantage point and a shift in the tired order of things. I thought it was about which of these... In a sense, is the coolest and greatest? Perhaps for a layman, deep analysis is necessary to peel back the multi-layered meanings. She scoffs. Do her words seem vague and abstract to you? Do you recommend it? Certainly. It's prudent for a person to have at least an elementary understanding of history and society. Imagine the chaos we'd be in otherwise. You feel like you should get this one. Definitely. It's important somehow. There's something personal inside. Okay, but I... Okay, look through the display of books. Browsing through all the books with all their names makes your head spin. None of these seem important or relevant. 
It's all just vapid egoism. Okay. Suddenly, a particularly odd title catches your eye. It reads, High Speed Love, the tragic true love story of Jacob Irv and Alfie Delatraz by one Cecilia Averbrook. What's it about? High Speed Love chronicles the romance between two of the finest tip-top tournay racers in history. One of them is the madcap driver, Jacob Irv. His blonde mane graces the cover. Next to Irv's life story, you see a slim biography of an Occidental rock star called The Anti-Star. He's famous for shooting morphine into one of his eyeballs and cocaine into the other. The frick? Next to that, Rivasholian radio personality, Guillaume Bevy, stands in front of a rundown drug den. He's a permanent fixture on Channel 8, reporting on real-life crime and ruining cops' days. I really must insist you buy one of the books. Reading them is not for free. Do still browse, though, but not too long. She understands she has erred against the customer and immediately corrects course. I'm sorry, I did not mean to rush you. You are browsing. Go ahead. Take your time. Time is commerce. I'll go ahead and buy this one. A true cultural touchstone. Enjoy the read. <sighs> Call the Mama Takwa. It's not only your eardrums that register sound anymore. Your very skin has become an organ of hearing. Looking for a whisper, light and low. A god who's very, very silent. Nothing escapes you. A cockroach in the other room. A candy wrapper falling on dry grass. A drunk falling from a chair in a bar 20 meters away. In fact, you haven't heard the call du mama dakwa, but you have discovered that you have amazing hearing. It must be the only part of you the alcohol hasn't drowned out. Keep listening. Ooh, plus three to perception, but I lose one encyclopedia. Alright, I like that. That's nice. Another boring book, just discarded. This bookstore is not strictly about crime, romance, and biographies of famous people. There's also a wide range of paranatural literature. Look through the shelf. Amidst the various books, you find one written by someone named Matthias W. Dundas. It's about wholeness, unity, balance. These three things are very important to the working class mind. The point of the book, and many others on this shelf, is to give people medicinal advice in situations where they don't have access to paid health services. How does that work? It serves platitudes, while also telling everyone that traditional medicine, the kind people don't have access to, and which costs more than this book, is garbage, and would only give you cancer anyway, without even curing your cold or anything. Wholeness, unity, balance, on the other hand, can basically take care of anything. Though it is important to note, when it's up to your mind to heal yourself, then it's because of your mind that you're ill in the first place. Does the book say anything else? The book features chapters on topics such as how to find magnesium. It even lists plants you can harvest magnesium from. How to continue drinking if you're an alcoholic who has destroyed his liver. And... There's even a chapter on the ancient Serais tradition of using duck gold bladder preservatives to treat and prevent sexually transmitted diseases. Pre and post factum apply. Nothing worth buying. Okay. This is just mundane garbage. What's even paranatural about this? Find something truly otherworthy. Yes! <laughs> what books are these? Hum, sir, please, no browsing in that shelf. That wisdom is not for free. What? She narrows her eyes. I can't have you end up, like, opening a police store next door and stealing my customers. Oh, no. The frick? Okay. I'm going to roll this. Even though it's super high, it's still possible to fail. 
So just this in case it's not strictly about crime. The throbbing in your head increases with every passing moment you gaze at this shelf. Suddenly, as if out of nowhere, a small green book becomes apparent. The title of it reads Medicinal Purposes of the Pale. What's the pale? The book contains very little explanation on the matter. This knowledge seems to be taken for granted. What's the book about? The book contains descriptions of various pseudoscientific therapies, alternative medicines, and folk remedies involving the pale, also known as le territoire. For example, it recommends vigorously swatting one's naked body with a venic or hand broom <laughs> made from the leafy twigs of a young birch tree from the near pale. That sounds painful. It is supposedly invigorating and good for the circulation. What else? It also recommends consuming distilled spirits like vodka or whiskey that have been aged in the pale. Readers are instructed to cover these jars in a shallow hole just inside the pale and leave them there for 30 to 60 days, depending on the potency desired. And what does this pale age liquor do? Among other benefits, it is alleged to restore a damaged liver to perfect health. Mm -hmm. That seems improbable. I should probably get my hands on some of that. What else is in there? <laughs> For general health and well-being, readers are encouraged to take regular strolls through the pale. Though a sidebar cautions readers to limit each stroll to less than an hour. These strolls promise to cleanse the mind of worries and the body of toxins, especially if the perambulator performs this ritual in the nude. Nudity figures prominently in a number of these prescriptions. This is exactly what you need. Huh. Anything else of note? There's an entire section devoted to cures for men who are struggling to perform their marital obligations. <laughs> I may need that. Excuse me, sir. I believe you've been perusing that particular volume long enough. If you'd like to continue reading, I must insist you buy it. I'm going to leave. 